My name is Umar Nizomani, and today I'm going to talk about continuous testing with Android. So before I start, I'd like to let you know what we're going to discuss. This is going to be an advanced topic. Uh, we'll be discussing how to create reliable applications so that we can do continuous testing, especially in the Android environment, because the entire infrastructure is really distributed. So this is why we will be talking about uh, how to create tests that are reliable and the developers can actually accept that they would work, and also do UI testing and set them up on a continuous building system. But before I start, I think all technology choices depend on the context, on the context in which these choices were made. So first, a bit about me. Uh, I'm from Pakistan. I've been coding since I was 13. I started off with mobile games. And after five years of that, we pivoted to experiential marketing, where I work with Android, iOS development, and a lot of shader development, Arduinos, all over the programming domain. This gave me more expertise on what kind of uh, testing is required for big corporations. And that's when I joined Sense Health around 10 months ago as a tech lead. Uh, here, my role initially was as an Android developer for their flagship product called Goli. And my role was how to improve the reliability and stability of the product at first, and then think about improving the feature development. So first, a bit about Sense Health. Sense Health built applications to monitor and coach you on the, to optimize your quality of life. So behind this entire marketing statement, what we build is applications that coach you. Uh, firstly, you measure yourself using your phone sensor, if you're moving enough, if you're sleeping enough, and then we coach you so that you can have a better lifestyle. This app, uh, these kind of applications are primarily used, I think I pressed the wrong button, are primarily used, sorry about that, by our two key products, firstly, Goli and Brighter. So both of these applications are about measuring yourself, firstly. Brighter is mainly focused on quantified self, and also how to change people's behaviors and habits. The key, feature, uh, the key product that I'm going to talk about today is Goli, because this was what I was involved with. And from a technology perspective, this is how our stack looks like right now. Um, we have a coaching engine. Uh, this is the whole holy grail of our monitoring and machine learning algorithms. We have libraries on Android and iOS, which are responsible for sensing, to use your phone's raw sensor data and figure out how much you move and if you sleep well enough or not. And then, over time, coach you so that you change your habits to have a better lifestyle. Uh, because we have a distributor architecture, our intelligence and all machine learning code is written in C++, which is used by both of the platforms from Android and iOS and used across all of our products that we build. Uh, to make sense of the presentation, I'll just guide you quickly through Goli. Uh, Goli is used by patients who have depression or ADHD, mental conditions. Uh, we connect them to therapists, and we use their phone's raw sensor data to figure out higher level metrics, like if you're sleeping, moving, and what kind of habits you've produced. And then we coach you to direct you to a better lifestyle. This entire platform is connected to a web dashboard and uh, allows the therapist to have a better profile over you. Now, so the problems with such products specifically, and specifically this product, was firstly, technical debt. I think anyone who's coded in a startup or any, any corporation knows that technical debt is a thing. And we all don't know why we're going slow with our product development, but everyone knows it's there. The product owners aren't happy that the products are slow and the bugs keep coming back in. So you can never work on that big feature that you're planning because the bugs keep coming back in and the cycle is really vicious. Uh, secondly, we have ownership problems. The code base is old. A lot of people worked on it. The code base works across multiple languages and platforms. We've had tech strengths that have people who have come and gone, going from machine learning to our coaching experts, who are real psychologists working with the product, to Android, iOS developers, and product developers who are skilled in UI. When you have so many layers of failure, no one's actually willing to take up ownership when something breaks. And this is something that's common. When products scale, these things happen. Another key problem, if you know Game of Thrones, everyone's Jon Snow, no one knows how the entire stack works because you cannot have complete knowledge in one product team. There are distributed components, everyone's an expert of their own domain, and then the problems actually scale out when the product has more features coming in over time. No one can tell you what exactly is going wrong, you just know that the users are facing a crash in your application. And finally, it's still a startup. 
So you have to take a lot of roles. You still have to build a lot of features, and there are deadlines. So it's not like the management will say that, all right, take the next few weeks off and rewrite the entire code base, the next few months off, actually, and rewrite whatever you want, because you just cannot do that in a startup. These are things that a lot of products face, but it's really hard to get out of these situations, because no one's willing to put in the trust, and no one knows what the right solution is for this. So when I joined this, the first question I asked was, hey, where do I even begin? The application is crashing, the product owners are unhappy, but you just need to figure out a strategy that's iterative and allows you to improve your product step by step. So the first thing that I did as soon as I joined the team was focus on the quick wins first. What are quick wins? If you do not have to understand the code that you're beginning to fix, it's a quick win. Because understanding code is one of the hardest problems. You have to spend weeks to figure out what years of these development that has happened over time. How does it look? How, does all, how do all the functions work? Where do these different interfaces interact with each other? Where is the UI crashing? But if there are some tools, like static analysis tools, if you use such tools, then you can quickly find out what are potential causes of crashes in your application and make sure they're fixed without even knowing how the code is working. I'll explain a few of these tools. Um, firstly, there is Infer. This was created by Facebook. Facebook uses, in, uh, uses it in their uh, continuous deployment cycle. It's also being used by all the top tech companies like Uber, Square, to make sure that the products are reliable. So what does Infer do? Infer will go through your code base and find out common logic failures that are easy to miss out. Um, it's hard to explain this if I try. It's easier if I show you some code. I'm not sure it's, if it's completely legible here, but the, this function, the first function here, might return null. It's, uh, it should return a string, but it can return a null under certain conditions. Then on the second function, which is actually utilizing it, is directly trying to access a property of this, access a method of this, without checking if it's null or not. This is something that will happen in your code as it evolves. The person who wrote the code first had the complete picture of it in his or her brain, but over time, things scale, a lot of features come in, and such bugs leak into your code. It's a very common practice. And this is something that you can't really track all the time. So if you use tools like Infer or static analysis tools, you can, these products can directly identify issues with your code base uh, by going through the source code and seeing potential branches that can cause these crashes to happen. Uh, Infer works on iOS and Android, so it gives you not a win only on Android, it also gives your iOS projects a reliability boost. Secondly, there's Lint. Lint is built directly into Android Studio. Uh, it's just a click away. If you're coding on an Android project, do try running Lint on it, see what comes out of it. Lint is actually quite advanced than Facebook Infer if you focus only on Android devices, because it is made by the team who made Android itself. And it doesn't only look at problems inside the code. It, has, it can look into issues that are far bigger than crashes. It can look into problems like security leaks, like resource leaks, if your application has a missing translation. This is something that the QA team would take months to find out that one page is missing a specific text if it's in Dutch or German than in English. These are problems that real products that have to ship from time to time do fail because of human error. And it's hard to catch them unless you use something like static analysis. So these two tools directly are extremely easy to set up and run on your existing code base. You do not need to know how the code works. And they give you potential crashes and also stabilize your product by showing you resource leak or translation errors. So everyone's happy, even the product owner. So I tried to run this on our existing code base as soon as I joined the team. And that was my first day. The problems that I found were actually quite amazing. Uh, we found 88 issues in our Android project and 49 in iOS. The one point to note here is that the Android code base only had 22 issues in our own code, but we were using external libraries directly by source. These are, again, points of failure that you cannot specifically go through and analyze if it has a problem or not. But static analysis gives you a quick win because you just import a library and you run the tool on it, and then you can see these crashes that are potentially fatal for your application. Because you, these are your customers who are using the app. They will not care about what library is on the back end. On iOS, Infer is actually extremely more powerful, because iOS is statically compiled to, 
Uh, and because Lint is far more superior for Android, I preferred running Infer first on iOS. This, again, was an instant boost for our code base because we recovered from uh, a lot of errors, let's say. Okay. I think we should remove this key. Uh, secondly, when we run Lint on our code base, we found 5,000 warnings. It's, it's a huge number. It was an overflow in the entire console. We didn't want to look at it. No one wanted to take ownership. And I understand when you have sprints and deadlines, you don't want to look at all of these 5,000 different warnings. You just ignore them and go on. But there are potential crashes that happen because of these issues. So firstly, I went through all the fatal and critical conditions that would have caused our app to crash, and translation problems that we found out, and resource problems, and st stabilized step by step fixing through them. So the result of static analysis was that I spent three days on this. One day was running it, setting it up in Docker, and running it on, of, on all of our projects. That's four different projects, because we have two key products on two different platforms. So that's four projects. And we managed to fix over 100 potentially fatal crashes in three days, and 150 layouting issues that were there, but unknown to the QA team or the product team. They might have been seen by our users, but we never know. So static analysis gave us very quick wins really fast. After this point, now we're pretty much scratching the surface. We have actually done a lot to the code base to stabilize it. But now comes the point of, uh, and you can actually buy time if you start doing this in your company, because this gives you credibility. The product owners and the management understands that what you're doing is actually helping the application. Now comes the real problem, the technical debt that has leaked into the application over years. How do you reduce such big problems in two weeks? Well, I had worked with similar tools before, so it gave me an insight to do this faster. Well, there's one way to do it. If you just delete the code, the problem's gone. But I don't think the product owners would be happy with that. So I thought, all right, I think let's find a better way to do this stuff. Whenever working on startups or small teams, it's really important to focus that you have to have maximum gains with minimum effort because no one's going to give you a lot of time to work with such problems. How do you have maximum gains? Make sure that you make stable tests. If you don't make stable tests, the dev teams won't take you seriously. Then you do make tests for now, but no one's going to maintain it. No one's going to care about your tests because they pass and fail randomly. And people will think it's a testing problem than the problem in the code itself. You make reliable tests by making sure that you remove points of failure and to maximize the impact, to maximize the testing strategy, you try to test like the end users would test the app. And how do the end users test? By actually clicking the buttons on your app. So instead of going deep down and trying to do unit tests of all the edge cases, what I focused on was how are the users clicking our apps, and are we showing all the screens that we should, and does the app crash during this process or not? So to go along with the strategy, the first rule was no mocking frameworks. A lot of people support mocking frameworks, but my strategy here was not to use it at all. The key reason being our application uses the hardware sensing capabilities of a phone. Our apps vary according to different devices by different hardware manufacturers. And these are problems that scale up as Android OS's update or iOS updates. You have to make sure that you're covering the entire infrastructure and not just that single block of code that you wrote. So if you skip the entire mocking frameworks, what are you left with? Well, Android gave a new feature called the activity test rule in Android 4.4 plus. This allows you to test your application exactly how your OS would turn on your activity. It does not mock you in a simulation environment. It packages your entire activity and allows it to, in, and allows it to be initialized by the OS just like it would in the final application. It's, it allows you to run by intent, that means if your application has a bug because you were trying to share a photo and that intent caused your app to crash, there is no way to test this except by using an activity test rule because you can use intents to go to the activity that you want. And if you try to be a ninja, you can do a lot more stuff with it, like uh, you can have activity test rules that are inherited and have more complicated features directly built into them. Secondly, I tried to test with Espresso, but let's just first talk how does testing look without this framework, Espresso. This is um, actually similar to how our tests were written before that. We didn't have too many tests, but some of them that were there were written like this. 
And this is a common practice that I see in a lot of testing uh, ideologies, that you do a click, and then you wait for the API to do something, and hopefully it will do it in this time, and then you go forward with it. The key problem is this. When you try to wait an unknown amount of seconds hoping the API would work, this single test case might run on your phone because you're using the cutting edge Galaxy S8, but it will not run on older devices because of a hardware freeze up, because, I don't know, an OS got an update, and this introduces flakiness in your tests. Your tests pass randomly, and sometimes they just start failing because an update was coming in, something was running in the background, or some weird kind of problems start showing up, again, decreasing the reliability of your entire testing methodology, which reduces trust in your app. So how does Espresso do it? Well, firstly, it's actually really close to how users work. If you look at this code, um, we are going through three different steps. Firstly, we find the view that's the name field, and then we perform an action on it, which is typing a text in it, and the text is Steve. And then secondly, we go to the button that's called the greet button, and we perform an action on it that's called click. And this is exactly how your end users are actually performing actions on it. And finally, to validate that the test worked or not, we did not just check this random uh, piece of code that what it outputted. We actually look at the screen, and we check if a dialog saying, hey, Steve, actually shows up and is being displayed on the screen. So this changes the entire perspective of testing, because you're not testing individual isolated pieces of code. You're actually testing how your end users look at the application itself. And this allows you to use more uh, actually really creative ways of testing, because the final check method allows you to have a lot of different use cases. Is it completely displayed? Is it half displayed? Is it being overlaid by something on top of it? Is the text with the right color or not? There are so many edge cases that could be covered directly by looking at how your end users are viewing the app. So this is actually a real test case from our testing setup. Um, which just tests how does the application look when you do not enter an email and try to do a login button on it. So if you see, this was actually recreated step by step directly from a QA report, because the first line finds the email, and then it performs a clear text operation. We're making sure that there's nothing filled into it. And then we just close the keyboard, because that's what the QA did. They cleared the text, they closed the keyboard, because we don't want anything in the email field. Secondly, we go to the password field. We clear the text. We enter a valid password. And then we click the sign-in button. And we check that if the final text box actually had the error text that this field is required. This kind of test case also is, uh, works across translations. Because we are not looking for the exact text that there was an error or has no email. We are looking for a string resource that says that this error should be there. So this means your testing can actually work across multiple translations. Those resource problems that were showing up but never showed up in your unit test are automatically gone because you're using string to string resource comparisons. And this can be extremely powerful if you have your own device set up because you can have multilingual devices who are running these tests and catch up resource leaks far easily. So covering through these points, uh, how does Espresso help us? Firstly, we don't have to sleep. We don't want to be sleeping in our tests. We want our tests to work fast and make sure they're reliable. Expresso can wait for asynchronous tasks. This is actually a really cool feature if you use async tasks. What happens is that every time you're using a background operation, you should be careful to perform it in an asynchronous task queue. And Espresso can magically just wait for this queue to empty up before going forward. What this allows us to do? Um, for example, you're doing an API call, but not one. You have to do five API calls. If all of them are in the async task queue, Expresso will wait. It will wait for all of these operations to end. Then it will wait for that async task animation that you had, maybe. And then it will perform the final checkup. So this, again, maps more closely to the end user behavior than it does to this isolated piece of code. Because the end users just wait for the screen to go to the next one and then report the error of what came wrong. And you can also create custom matchers, which allows you to do really cool stuff if you have complicated components. Uh, doesn't matter how big the scale of your Android apps is. You can utilize those custom uh, injected attributes that you have for testing too. So this looks awesome. We have native activity tests. That means we are not mocking anything. Um, 
and we are actually doing real view assertion. We are really close to how end users are working. So this should look enough, good enough, but there's still some things missing. The technical debt isn't that easy. We have more technical debt into our code. Our application initializes everything from a single activity. This is something that happens over time. We are, our app has a home screen, which launches first, and then it does the initialization of all sensors, initialization of the session tokens, authentication, whatever it needs to do, it does there. And after everything has loaded, only then does it go to the next calls. This is something that happens in legacy code a lot. And this is something that's really hard, makes things quite tricky, especially to set up things like deep links. So if you're testing a screen that's I don't know, 20 clicks into it, you get a new user report that when you register a unique new user and you go to the 15th screen in your app, the app crashes, that means you have to write code that goes through all of these 15 screens before you can actually test it. This would be testing nightmare. What if the UI team or the product team suddenly says, hey, we don't want this screen in the middle. Would you go back and update all of your tests to reflect that change? That's, that's just not maintainable. This causes more problems down the road. And for this problem, in comes the robot pattern. Uh, this was introduced by Jake Wharton, who are familiar with Android, might know him. Um, and the robot pattern looks something like this. It's very similar to how you talk in natural language and how the reproducibility reports look like. So the report that we got, the, this is an actual test case in our app. It says that you have to go to the home screen of the app with a valid new user and we make sure that we are actually on the home screen, we are not in some random screen because the testing case had a bug. Again, improving reliability of the tests themselves. And then we try to config configure a goal. Uh, we have step counters in our app, so you can have movement goals for the target amount of movement you want to do. This makes things, again, really close to how the PO and the, the test QA team has been reporting bugs to us. So let's go deeper into the go to home screen with valid new user. It looks like a giant function that could be doing a lot of operations. So what this function does inside it is that it has a login robot. The login robot has a single to a task that says go to the register screen. Then register a unique new user. How this helps us, we have a single function for registering all of our spam accounts. That means if at any point the, the database team or the backend team wants to delete all of our accounts, we know how all of them are made because the entire new registration system is inside one function. You can modify it at any second that you want. Uh, what if your entire sign-in form or registration form has changed? You just have one place to modify it, and suddenly all of your tests still work. Nothing changed. It's part of that same sprint where you were impl implementing the new registration feature, and the testing didn't change at all. And then we have an onboarding robot which skips the onboarding screen so that you don't have to go through the tour. I'll go a bit deeper. So this is the go to register screen robot. Again, all of this is actual code from our actual testing environment being used right now. What the go to register screen does is that it's, it checks what screen are you in. For example, if you've already logged into the application, you would be on the home screen because the session has been validated. And there is no reason for you to be in the register screen. But this robot checks where you are and makes sure that you are logged out, the data is cleared, and that you perform, you do definitely get to the register screen no matter where you are. What this allows us to do is that all of our tests are isolated. They can run one upon the other no matter what state the device is in and still manage to be reliable, still manage not to break. And this allowed, helped us a lot because slowly over time we built a build farm with a lot of Android devices which would open up and run tests in parallel and these tests would run, turn on at any point. We did not know what state the last test left the phone in. But we could still be certain that the application would reach where it needs to reach. So what are the perks of the robot pattern? Um, it's clean, it's really intuitive. So once you create a test, it's reusable for all of the testing that you have to do. If you create, if the QA teams wants to create a new test case, they just have to use these robots, and it's a piece of cake to make a new test. Someone says, I need to go to the registration screen. They don't need to write anything. They just go like, login robot, get me to the home screen with a new user. And that's the job, job of the login robot to get you there. And one really powerful thing that came out of this is that all of our steps to reproduce, the, the QA reports that we were getting, are slowly mapping one-to-one -one with our test code. 
This gives a lot of power to the QA team. The QA team wants to be technical, but it's kind of hard for them if they have to go down to the nitty-gritty of Android to find out the best practices, or if they have to find out what the resource identity is called, or what the name of the device is, or the component is. But if you help abstract it a little, if you make sure that all of these are encompassed in natural language statements, the QA team would actually love to write tests themselves. It sounds great. We're actually having tests that are natural language from QA reports. We're using native activity tests. That means that our tests are actually running on real hardware, and they can actually em don't need to emulate anything. They can work on multiple devices, too, because they're stateless. They don't care what state the application was started in. And we are not waiting for seconds, so the tests are still reliable. They don't have to wait randomly for the API to function or not. And they are really expressive for the end user views. They check the views are displayed or not. There's still a but. The technical debt isn't that small that you can just clear it off all around. But the final part to this entire testing puzzle that we had was that at this point, we are testing all of the logic and the API calls, and we are reproducing the one-to-one -one QA reports are being reproduced and being tested one-to-one. -one. But no one's really looking at the phone. When the test runner turns on the app, it turns it on in the background mode. So we don't know what's being drawn on the screen. We don't really know exactly if the UI was drawn correctly or not. We are checking if the, the UI components are displayed or not, but we don't know how it looks. Maybe multiple resolutions cause it to fail. Maybe the text is gibberish because of an ASCII error or whatever the problem is. And UI testing can be extremely painful. And this is something that was initially quite challenging because if you try to make sure that, there, that your tests are also multi-platform and do test the positioning of each UI element, that means you can't really change the position of these elements, which creates another cycle. In a startup, you can't have tests that are so flaky or that require so much maintenance. Another key problem is that to make sure that these things run on real devices, because we are not mocking anything, and we have to check the hardware sensing capabilities of the devices too, we have to deploy them to real devices. And ADB is not really good with that. It's really not cool with it. If you try to run a test on multiple phones, ADB will fail. It will suddenly start hanging up. It will freeze your USB ports at random points. And it can create more overhead for the people writing the tests over time. So for this, let's Spoon. There's a framework called Spoon created by Square. This framework allows you to run your tests on multiple devices with a single line of code exactly how you were running tests before this on your own device that's connected to the computer, Spoon can similarly, with a single command, run on all devices that are connected to the phone itself via ADB and handles all the overhead of making sure that the processes are split across and separate by itself. So it's not our problem anymore. Someone else is updating it, which is a far bigger company, and also helps us be more lean with our testing. Secondly, a really powerful feature of Spoon, it can capture screenshots. So you can take a snapshot of how your app looks at that state wherever you want. And it can make animated GIFs out of it. So if you connect all of these screens that you were going from A, B, and C, it will make a pretty GIF out of it. That means our reproducibility reports turn from these text Excel sheets into GIFs that we could post on our Slack channel, and everyone could see the bug live in action, which means that everyone is more assertive. You can actually go out and see this bug happening on the screen and be more actionable on it. And because I have experience in game development, I'm really, I really want performance metrics for everything. Uh, Spoon gives you that for free. It gives you analytics. So let's see how Spoon works. It's a single line of code. You just tell Gradle to Spoon, and it does it for you. It finds all the devices that are connected to that computer. It will find the device IDs. It will install the app there. It will run all of your tests in parallel if you require it. It can set timeouts for each test, allows you to set up test suits. So all the accessibility that Gradle gives you, it adds upon it and allows you to be multi-environment for multiple phones. And it produces some really good HTML reports, like this. So this was the first, um, not exactly the first output, but this is the first uh, build farm output that came out of our testing. 
Uh, it's a bit illegible here, but we have 47 tests running on two different phones. There is a reason that we are only showing two here that I will go later on in the lessons that we learned with our testing. The two devices that we had were a, a Sony phone, which has a really big screen, so that we can test how layouting works on the big screen and the smaller screen. And they have OS differences. The Sony phone is a 4.4, and the other one is a 4.1. Um, one thing to notice if you see the slide later on, it's eligible here, is that the Sony phone runs 24 tests and the Samsung one runs 23 tests. And the reason for this downgrade is UI Automator, because UI Automator is another framework that allows you to test the device from outside of the app and use the notification drawer that comes on top of Android and press the home button, swipe through the screen, put your app in background and turn it on again. But this feature is only for Android 4.4 Plus, so that's why it only runs on one device. Again, something that Spoon automatically allows you to do, because you can target OS versions per features. So write your test once, define what hardware platforms you need, what capabilities you need, and Spoon will handle the rest. It will just automatically deploy it. Our test reports now look something like this. Uh, these are tests that run nightly on any branch that has been actively worked on the previous night. They give you visual screenshots using the robot pattern. What we do is that every screen that changes, we take a screenshot of it. And before any per action is performed, like clicking a submit button, we also make sure we take a screenshot with the text that was inputted into all the fields, allowing us to make sure that we know the complete picture of how our tests look. So this removes a lot of question marks from the test case. Uh, because you can see the results live, and they're happening every night, this allows the product owners to see progress of your app as it's being developed, because it's a nightly branch. It happens every night. And it also gives you analytics. This is something who, if people are interested in, if you open up a test, it shows you the average time it took to run this test across all devices or per device. And as you can see, we can test our app in an average of four seconds for a single test case, which is very dumb. But at the same time, this test case involves turning on your app from scratch, so the time it takes to boot up your activity, and the time it takes to fill in. So measuring how long it takes to boot up your activity is something that is quite tricky, actually, in real life. But with Spoon, we get these metrics for free. We can see exactly how long it takes to boot up or shut down an app just by creating two dumb tests that do nothing, just turn on and turn off the app. And these are the kind of metrics that allow you to have more insights into your projects and still maintain the reliability that we're talking about. And finally, Spoon also gives you all the ADB logs gathered from all devices, again, in the HTML report. So if something goes wrong in the background because the OS was functioning weird or because your API was crashing or any weird problem, you can actually see it in the logs. Um, for example, one of the weird pesquier issues that we were having initially was sometimes the connectivity would lose, which was because of the Wi-Fi, and we found it in the logs that, hey, the Wi-Fi isn't connecting to the phone, so you can't do API calls, and that's it. So nothing's hidden from you. It's, it gives you the complete control that the ADB console gives you, just in a prettier HTML report, and also on multiple devices. So at this stage, I felt that because we were really time constrained to do this in within two to maximum of three weeks with deployment, I felt the testing was quite thorough. We are touching all the edge, or the front cases, the major cases of turning on the app and going to all screens, and we are also taking screenshots. So, hey, if you can't really go through native uh, UI testing by checking the position of components, at least you can take a screenshot. So, if the designer has a problem, they can see how the app looks at runtime. So now let's make this continuous. You don't want to run these tests that take 10 minutes every day on your computer. For this, we set up a build form. Um, as soon as I entered the office in the first week, I saw they had this old, tall Mac that was not being used by anyone. And I thought, hey, why not? We have a build form in our office. Let's just connect Android devices and set it up with Jenkins. And that's what we did. We just set up different phones connected via USB cables. and. Um, applied the required settings and forgot about it for a little while. Well, we're still a startup. The cleaning lady comes in and disconnects the ADB. That's an actual problem when you're a startup. These things do happen. The Wi-Fi goes down or someone changes the Wi-Fi password. These things that you face, but more or less, we didn't have to touch our device farm much. I think for the first few months, there were zero problems and the nightly tests kept running. The build farm looks 
something like this, but it's a really ugly picture. And as it's a startup, you know, we just stashed it in a corner. But from the nerdier side of me, I like this picture far more because it has 16 cores. And when you run Gradle on it or iOS builds that are correctly tuned on it, you can utilize all 16 cores with 100%. And that makes tests run really fast because, again, as I said, the tests were set up to be parallel. And this allows us to make sure all of tests are firing as fast as possible and no core is left alone. Then we set this Jenkins on this to make sure that we do nightly builds. The nightly builds were set up in such a way that if any branch had an active commit history in the previous night, Jenkins would pick it up at night when everyone's home and build the APK out of it, run it on Gradle on all the devices, and upload an HTML report onto our servers so that the POs can view it the next day, the product owners of the application. So what this changed was the entire paradigm of testing. Instead of having lots of QA going through the app every day, or the product owners constantly burging the development team of how is the progress going on a feature, we just set this up and we forgot about it. And the developers were coding, and the product owners could every day come into office and see screenshots of what's changed in one day. So this means that you don't even have to deploy your application to Crashlytics or any testing framework, because hey, you can see the app functioning and being evolving day to day, depending on what branch you're in. And we also, the, our, our testing strategy changed a bit that instead of making sure we write tests first, which is really hard in an organization that hasn't been writing tests for years, the only way that you can tilt this mentality slowly is that if you tell them whatever feature you're building, just make an empty test for it that takes a screenshot and turns off. What this allows us, you have a screenshot of every new feature being built, and the product owners can see it, so it gives the developers more confidence that this testing setup does help somewhat, and then the QA team can assist them to write more tests and allow them to be uh, more widely utilized. And this also ensured that all of our features were actually built correctly from the start, because the features that we're developing, it wouldn't happen that halfway through we go like, okay, this is completely wrong, because you can see nightly progress. The build steps for this were simple. Um, we run a job on all branches with a new commit the previous night. We'd empty out the phone. This was done because we have a complicated uh, sensing library that senses a lot of different components, which can have buggy builds. So we remove all of our test setups from the phones, and we re-set up a clean install on the, on the devices. We run the test with Spoon, upload an HTML report, and post a link to Slack, and that's it. This is done every night on, uh, on all of the devices that are connected to the build form. So the final setup that we went for looks something like this. We have native activity tests. That means we're not mocking anything. We're using real hardware sensors with uh, devices that are made from multiple vendors with different OSs, making our coverage go really wide. We have expressive view assertions. That means really close to how the QA reports bugs. Uh, the testing is more closer to natural language. That means whenever a product owner gives us a report of what the bugs were or the steps to reproduce, we could directly map it to our testing platform. We have UI testing by just screenshots, and it's continuous, thanks to Jenkins. So this was the setup that we set up um, around a year ago. And uh, over this time, we've learned some lessons that I'd also want to share if someone wants to go ahead and deploy this. So the lessons learned, um, firstly, Never, reply, never rely on wait for seconds. If you wait for seconds, the APIs will fail, your tests will be flaky, and the developers will start ignoring the test suit. This has something that has happened in our organization over time a lot of, or a lot of times. Uh, secondly, we used a fork of Spoon called Falcon Spoon, which allows us to take screenshots, including the dialogues that are not of our, app, uh, of our activity, on top of the activity, and make sure that we have a complete picture of what dialogue is being showed, and if there are other warnings that we aren't aware of, as this is a build form. And then don't run it on more than two devices. This is something that we learned the hard way. Uh, I ordered really expensive USB hubs and USB cables to make sure that we can have all devices that are spare and allow them to test. But off more than two devices will introduce flakiness at some point or the other. We were able to make sure that our tests run fine for a week, but then the next week, something would suddenly turn up as failing, even though the test was correct, because the ADP misfired, there was a race condition in, in the Mac, or something or the other. 
So this is why I, I did some research on this, looking at how other organizations are doing this too. And I finally set out that the holy grail of devices should be kept to two. And if you want to go above, do it at your own risk. We face problems with this. More lessons. UI tests should work like end users test your application. You're building products for end users. You're not making it directly for the logic statement that you made. There are actual users, which is why the product is succeeding. And this is why you have to think how they think and how they use the app. Automated UI tests are extremely complicated. If you can't do them, just take a screenshot. If someone cares about the app, they will have a look, and you will catch bugs that are hard to track otherwise. Making tests should be really close to natural language, because this is why the QA team can be actually more involved with the products and expand on your tests. And this is something that I did see. Uh, I wrote 24 tests with all of these things that I learned, and I forgot about the testing pattern because I had more stuff to do. But the QA team really picked up our testing infrastructure. And by now, we have over 300 tests that test every single feature of the application end to end. And this is really impressive, looking at how the QA team initially was struggling to write any code because there was such a big barrier, there was such big friction. But if you make it easy for them, they just want to help you make better products. And that's how we made our apps safe again. So thank you. <laughs>